Hi guys, I'm Gwyneth Paltrow. Welcome to the Goop Podcast. Every Thursday, Goop editors will be sitting down with provocative thinkers, industry disruptors, and culture changers. I'll take turns interviewing barrier-breaking guests as we talk about shifting old paradigms and starting new conversations. Today's guest, psychiatrist Dr. Robin Berman, is an associate professor of psychiatry at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, and also the author of Permission to Parent, How to Raise Your Child with Love and Limits, which we consider to be something of a parenting Bible here at Goop. When Dr. Berman was first establishing her own practice, she intended to work solely with kids until she realized that she couldn't do much for kids without reparenting the grown-ups. So if you can't forgive yourself and you can't forgive your parents, then you are constantly a victim. You have this great privilege Mm -hmm. and honor to move past it. You have this way of saying, I deserve in this lifetime to feel lovable. Dr. Berman sat down with our chief content officer, Elise Lunin, to talk about the ways our parents affect us, both how we can grieve what we might not have received when we were young, and also how to move on from imperfect childhoods. Imagine a world if we lived in a place where everybody looked at everyone as their highest good, Mm -hmm. without judgment, without trash talking, without digging deep into their own stance and their own opinion and being in judgment and, oh, this person isn't that enough. Or the, So the love goggles need to come back, focusing on character and kindness. All of those internal structures are a formula for happiness. After the conversation, I'll be doing a quick round of Ask Me Anything. If you've got a burning or totally random question you want me to answer, hit us up at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. Now, let's get to Elisa's interview with Dr. Robin Berman. Dr. Berman, one of the things that I love most about your sort of trajectory and becoming who you are is that originally you were going to work with children, and then you realized, actually, I need to focus on the parents, right? Like the parents are the ones who need to reparent themselves in order to have better relationships with their children. Yes, because parenting goes through generations. So if you got lucky enough, like you did, you know, to get parents who are pretty darn good, you have a template for how to do it versus if you were parented by a narcissistic parent or an alcoholic parent or a rageful parent, then you don't have incorporated actually into the structure of your brain those neural pathways. So you have to teach them to yourself and learn to mother yourself in order to be a good friend, be a good partner, you know, when you if you ever have children to mother them. What I've become fascinated by recently is brain research. So you know they say it's always a childhood. Mm-hmm. They would say, oh it's you know Freud, it was always about the childhood. In fact my my dad is a liver specialist and he joked that he would have been a psychiatrist, but it was like, hello, oh it's about your childhood. <laughs> you know, but the truth is now we have neuroscience that backs up Freud, which is that as you're, you were the only species that comes with an undeveloped brain. Mm-hmm. So you come in, you've got that little soft spot, your skull is making room for the brain to explode in those first three years. And how does the brain grow? It grows on love. Mm-hmm. Everybody's brain grows on love. Mm. And you can literally see it now on scans that when people are well loved in parenting their their brain grows bigger and better and more connected which totally makes sense because they're in growth mode not in stress protection mode so from the ver- from the way humans are designed at the core we're designed to love so when you have a mom or a dad or two moms or two dads who look at you with that love in your eyes and that sparkle and they you're they're cooing at their baby and they're and they're connected and they're responsive and and that that forms an integrated healthy brain so then that kind of the lucky kid club won that and, and has an easier time passing it down and an easier time, you know, in general, unless they, you know, are aware of what they missed out on, which everybody (laughs) figures out at some point where the holes show up in their own psyche. There isn't anybody who doesn't have some holes in their psyche. And then you get to, you know, go to therapy, you get to reparent yourself. And that's actually 
where the fun begins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I don't know if you've heard of the Hoffman process, but in Northern yes. California, yes, but I, have. I was talking to the CEO and essentially the Hoffman process is that you go for a week and you check in and it's all about breaking early childhood patterns. And with the thesis being that before you're rational at the age of seven or wherever, mm -hmm. whenever that sort of comes mm -hmm. in, you learn how to receive and hold love. And if you didn't receive it as a child or you learned it was conditional or you had a narcissistic parent, there are all these ingrained beliefs that you're not even conscious of, but that it can really, you can bring the awareness and start to like break open those patterns. Cause I think so many people, they want to rationally understand. Yes, but it's primitive. It's so primitive. you just said it. It's your primitive brain. So your primitive brain, if you're a neuroscientist, forms first, right? If you study neuroanatomy, you see the primitive brain, like the fight or flight, you know, survival brain shows up first. And then the cortex, which we call executive function, the presidential thinking, planning, you know, being moderate, measured, whatever, that comes with learning. So the frontal cortex is growing again with love. So the primitive brain that gets locked in early, you know, is my parent safe? Let's just use mommy, even though I mean primary caregiver. Is my mommy safe? Is she receptive? Does she understand me? Pre-verbal, through eye contact, through sound, through cooing, pre-verbal, it gets locked into your brain. So it is something, and not to minimize what we're going to talk about, how do you move forward from an imperfect childhood? I wouldn't be a psychiatrist if I didn't believe you could move forward and, and use it as rocket fuel for your magnificent development. I would not, and have had I not seen it so many times, I wouldn't believe it. But it is a struggle because of how it's, how your brain got wired. So you have to kind of unlearn some of the belief systems that you were taught. And that's why that Hoffman Institute, I think they have you bury your childhood, oh, really? which I think is a really cool exercise, like write down everything and then literally bury it under, like in a grave and just put it away and say goodbye to it and grieve it like it's a death. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually is part of the process of healing is when you realize as uh, you know, you start dating and there's a conflict and some of your old, you basically, when you get married, you marry someone else's childhood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You've married, you're, you're, you've married your husband's childhood, at least I hate to break you and he's, true. he's married yours, <laughs> right? So unless we get conscious of a pattern, we just repeat it. And the beauty of healing yourself and realizing that your self-esteem doesn't depend on what your mom or dad think of you. That's so big. People have, they can hear their mom's voice in their head. They can hear their dad's voice in their head. They can hear the critique. You shouldn't wear jeans. You have stumpy legs. I mean, if I could list every comment I've ever heard from a patient, you know, you know, you're, you're too shallow. You have too horrible posture. You're lazy. You're selfish. You, you know, you'll, you're, you're dumb at school. School's never going to be your bag. It's actually interesting. I just had um, dinner with a friend of mine and she's, birthed a bunch of she birthed the unplug the meditation center she's birthed amazing oh, stuff Susie. yes yeah, Susie Schwartz right and we had dinner and we were talking about her she was not a student like academic school like was our bag it was not her bag and her mom said you might not read the, the New York Times but you're probably going to own the New York Times so it was a way of actually really seeing who she was that she was an entrepreneur and a, a thinker but academics wasn't her bag and that was was okay you know better to be good at life than good at school so that mother saw who her child was and reflected it back um, accurately, which is sometimes Hard. the problem. And I want to talk, I want to get to narcissism, but first I just wanted to make a, a comment too that so often a lot of these insidious beliefs are planted with love. And I think that can make it even sometimes more trippier, trippier. Like I was with <laughs> yeah. a really good friend who's incredibly talented and has this amazing career and she can't hold a compliment. So you say, mm -hmm. oh, you look amazing. She, oh, like you're just so much, you look so much better than I do. And it's like, mm -hmm. dude, just take the compliment. And, mm -hmm. and one night I was like, we have to unpack this. Like yes. why, why? And Ultimately, she was like a kind of a young child star mm. and her mom felt like she was, it made her mom anxious that she was getting too much attention. Mm. And so she would, she deflect. taught her to deflect. And clearly it's been in, in 
so part of her personality now where I'm like, you can hold attention. Like you yes. deserve it. Yes. Like let us shower you with, with love yes. and receive it. Totally. Receive love. Like her brain will grow with love, right? Yeah. Our brains are never, that's the beauty of this is that when you, when you give her that and you say, let's unpack it, which I love. And, and she, and you say, let me shower you, let receive it. Don't deflect it. Take it in, marinate on that. You're raising her serotonin in her brain. Mm-hmm. You're literally changing her neural chemistry, but just giving love. And I think part of it is sort of saying that's not true you know like so it's like let's break the myth and let's bust it and just become even I think becoming aware of where it came from and being like that's not that's something that she was taught and it's not actually who she is that's a crux of healing yeah that's boundary is the crux of healing separating out so you were kind of breastfed on whatever whatever beliefs your parents had, whether, down to politics, down to their ideology, down to whether they yelled and screamed or whether they were more measured, you you were breastfed on that. Then when you get to a certain place, you look back, I had a patient once who grew up with groupthink. So if she had a different opinion than her mom, her mom would be insulted. If she didn't like the same movie or the same clothes or the same whatever. And so when she got older, she dated a guy and he said, is this groupthink? Like what, you can't have your own opinion. And it literally dawned on her like 25 that she could individuate and totally like things that her parents didn't like and be, you know, follow her own political ideology and do it her. And that's freedom Mm -hmm. because we, we have so much self critique and so much judgment. So when you grow up and no one leaves childhood without wounds, let's just be clear. Mm -hmm. There isn't a person on the planet. It'd be kind of boring if they did, right? Be kind of boring. Wouldn't be very interesting. So nobody leaves with, you know, unfortunately some people get a ton of wounds, Mm -hmm. um, um, that they that which is more to unpack and a longer process but knowing that you could dive in there and s- rather than feeling victimized by it because that's what keeps people stuck so if you can't forgive yourself and you can't forgive your parents then you are constantly a victim so i'm thinking of a patient i saw whose mother was really really lousy on a thousand abusive in a thousand ways and the mom died and she didn't shed a tear at the funeral and she said i i didn't shed a tear at the funeral i'm so angry right still so angry so she at 70 years old she was we unpacked it (laughs) And I have to say, it was one of the most gratifying things I've ever unpacked. So you could live with the pattern for 70 years. And we talked about how she stayed stuck because of a lack of forgiveness. That she, you know, they say anger too, you know, digs two graves. She just stayed stuck recycling those stories. She got so stuck in her story. It's like, end your story, start your life. You know, mm-hmm. people just play their stories. Mm-hmm. They run their stories like an obsessive loop in their brain that needs to be given some love Mm -hmm. and some boundary. Oh, I am not them. I'm going to choose to do it differently. I'm going to choose a different kind of relationship. But it starts with self-love. Yeah. It starts there. It's true. And it's like the, the crime persists. It's like you're not responsible. Anina Marjani, who was a guest on the podcast, said something really beautiful about responsibility for sort of how we manifest disease and it's you're not responsible for what happened to you but you are responsible to yourself to try to move past it you have this great privilege Mm -hmm. and honor to move past it you have this way of saying i deserve in this lifetime to feel lovable because at the core it all you know if you didn't get that love from the people who are supposed to love you the most. You walk around, am I lovable? Am I lovable? So you externalize what love is. Oh, if I wear really pretty clothes, I'll be special. Or if I become, you know, famous or, you know, go to graduate school or whatever, you externalize some way to get, which is completely an inside job. Mm -hmm. Or you drink alcohol to fill that hole. Or you eat food to fill that hole. But when you realize this kind of self-love and compassion is what fills the hole, and no judgment. Mm -hmm. Like if, if there's ever a group that's really judgy, it's new mothers. 
I mean, the guilt, and this is kind of going on, going on a limb here by making the statement, but I work at the Women's Life Center at UCLA and we do tons of postpartum and tons of postpartum anxiety. And the women always use the word guilt. And if they're in a heterosexual marriage, the men never share the guilt. So it's interesting. They just don't feel as guilty. And they say, I feel sad about what happened, but I don't feel guilty. So in some way, that's better. They're already past that self-judgment and guilty and, um, you know, self-critique. So part of growing up is not needing the approval of your parents to be independent and whole. To be whole, people think if I go back to the scene of the original crime, my own child, and, and I get my mom or my dad, it's usually the mother, I hate to say it's usually the mother, to f- say she's sorry, to get down on her knees and cry and hug me of that rapprochement, which sometimes does happen and it's magnificent. But if you keep going back to that well and it's dry and your mother or father says, I never did that, or you're being crazy, or, you know, get defensive, get angry, blame it on you. There's no healing there. And people keep returning to the scene of the original crime to going back to that dry well to be filled Mm -hmm. up. And when you realize you're responsible for your own self-esteem, it's a very empowered place that the, that, that your thoughts are your own now. The ones they put into your head, you can go to my new favorite combination of therapy is CBT, DBT. (laughs) And DBT used to be the treatment for suicidal borderlines and managing feelings, but now it's very mainstream. Mm -hmm. And it's how do you tolerate the distress? And the CBT is how do you change the, the, the tape, flip the script in your brain from a negative critical to you're okay. You're doing the best you can. You have so much going on. You know, how do you love yourself in a way that grows the muscle in your brain? I started out today saying in my head that uh, the three things I wanted to mention that you know at Goop, food is medicine. Mm -hmm. But the other big one is your thoughts are medicinal. Mm -hmm. So when you're speaking gracefully to yourself, you're actually changing your neurochemistry. And then healthy relationships are healing. I have a dear friend. She says there's three types of friends, the, the, the type of friend or marriage or partnership that brings you down. There's the type that keeps you just stagnant, and there's a spiritual elevator up. Mm-hmm. Find that top third mm-hmm. and stay with them. So as you become healthier, your vibe attracts your tribe, right? The healthier you become, it's kind of magical. You start pulling in healthier people into your world, and that's very healing. A healthy partnership is the best therapy. Mm -hmm. I'm putting myself out of business here. (laughs) (laughs) But a healthy partnership and being seen and loved Mm -hmm. wholly for who you are. Mm -hmm. I recently um, had a friend who was going through a crazy rough time and very much acting out and on all kinds of fertility hormones and, and really not doing well and very much not herself and impatient and working too many jobs all the way through. And she got flowers from her husband saying how unconditionally he loves her. Mm. And she said at the height of her ugliness and her acting out, she was lovable. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with our own childhoods is some of us were raised on, if you don't behave, I'm going to leave the room. If you don't do as I say, I'm going to pout. I'm going to slam a door. I'm going to favor your other sibling. So love was very contingent on performing as opposed to that beautiful, unconditional love that everybody deserves that as you journey on, you can start giving yourself and then your friends start giving it to you and your partner starts giving it to you because you are vibrating that in your own being. Yeah. And I think even if you have a, a, had a, a healthy childhood, um, as you said, no one emerges unscathed and, and just being able to disentangle or like get a new vantage point on your own parents and, you know, I know we've talked about this idea of grateful grieving, but this idea of being so thankful for everything that they did for you and loving them, but also mourning maybe the parts that you, mourning the things that you didn't get and and also looking at it within the perspective of what, what was, what did they learn? You know, I look at my mom, who's an incredible woman. I'm so grateful. She didn't 
have a great mom. Mm-hmm. She never really mother- was mothered. And so also being able to look back with the context of my mom's take on childhood, which was very focused on making sure we had everything that we needed, but not, not a lot of like, she wasn't going to spend a lot of time wrapping birthday presents or um, sending care packages. I remember being at, I was at boarding school and I was like, mom, where's my care package? Where's my care package? <laughs> Are you not? And she was like, what's that? And I was like, oh, like you could send me brownies or cookies <laughs> or candy. Let me know you love me. And she was so confounded. She also hates mailing things, but um, she was like, well, why wouldn't I give you, I'll just give you some money and you can go to the store and get brownie mix. So you, so your love, you were telling her what would feel lovable, right? And that practical, so there's a remnant of her own not being mothered. Of course. Right? Here's the go buy brownie mix and do it yourself, which is, I'm sure, what she was breastfed on. Totally. And I love that you were giving her, uh, you have that open intimacy to say, this is what I need. Yeah. This you know, is... people think people are mind readers. Their partners are supposed to be mind readers. I had a patient whose husband always gave her something that plugged in, a toaster, a microwave, some kind. And at some point she was just resentful. I said, people are not mind readers. Ask for it. She's like, I don't want anything electronic. I don't want anything with the plug. And she was re- and since then, she's gotten gifts that really mean something. So you say, send me brownies. And she says, take the box, right? Yeah. So that's her own legacy. She had done so much work on herself, obviously, to mother you, who are so magnificent. She had done so much, you know, oh, I'm not going to repeat that. I'm going to do it differently. And clearly she did, but the, the box of, uh, yeah, of brownies things. and being so dumbfounded was was part of her own. It's so, But it's so awesome and, and so funny and but the grieving part I think you hit on the key yeah. part and that's why I I wrote that article with the grateful grieving concept is because the grieving is step one if you don't allow yourself to feel the feelings right and move through them like I always say feelings are like a wave you know they can kind of come at you but if you ride the wave they're going to crescendo and go down but people don't want to go into those places that scare them. You know, it's like the gold is in the dark. That famous quote, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. Like walking into it and saying, I didn't get this. I feel bad for myself. Being a victim is different than having empathy. Mm -hmm. Being a victim is saying, I'm going to be victimized for the rest of my life and I'm never going to move past it because it's impossible. You know, versus taking the power and saying, I really got gypped. And a lot of people did giant person, 40% of this country is insecurely attached. Mm. 40% has staggering, staggering some, so the missed connection. Um, so knowing that, that, that is a jip Mm -hmm. and you, you are so right to grieve that loss and, and bury it like they do at the Hoffman, you know, psychologically, metaphorically, physically through therapy, through having other mommy mentors, you know, my, I, you know, my favorite book as a kid was the mommy market and and you could go in and pick the kind of mom you wanted. Right. You could pick the cookie baking mom who made the brownies, <laughs> who actually made the brownies and sent the care package. You could pick that mommy. You could pick the mommy who was psychologically attuned all the time. You could pick the, you know, Jewish grandma that was making chicken noodle soup or the Italian mom. So you could really pick whoever you wanted. And the fantasy of going into an open market, like some witch gave this girl a key and that her siblings, they walked in and every day they would take home a different mom. And I think whoever wrote it was working through her own childhood of thinking, wow, I wish there was a perfect mom I could bring home. Of course, at the end, they realized there isn't. And that the combination of all of those people become part of the way you heal yourself. So if you keep going back to your parents and they get defensive and they don't own it, you have to look in other places, right? You have to look from girlfriends. You have to look from the Dalai Lama or spiritual leaders. Or Oprah said she was mothered by Maya Angelou. Right. Gosh, what a great mother. I know. <laughs> she, she got to pick Maya Angelou because she missed out on getting what she needed. So she got to build that kaleidoscope of mommy mentors and, and heal herself, mm-hmm. which is really where you, you start to take flight and you realize that you're giving yourself a soul bath. We'll have more of Elise's conversation with Dr. Robin Berman in a minute. In the meantime, let's talk about one of our partners. My husband and I have a hard time agreeing on what to make for dinner, which invariably means that we end up ordering takeout at 9 p.m. long after we fed the kids and put them to bed. 
And for this reason, I was thrilled to discover Freshly, which allows us to each pick our own menu of weekly dinners, all made by chefs. Essentially, Freshly is a meal delivery service that offers a menu of 30 plus options for lunch, dinner, or even breakfast. And it's all freshly prepared with no refined sugars, artificial preservatives, or hydrogenated oils. They also have a lot of gluten-free and virtuous options, so you won't feel overstuffed. Even their indulgent chicken parm is served with a side of broccoli. Essentially, the way it works is that you sign up, pick the number of meals you'd like each week, and then they make it all to order. It's pre-portioned and then shipped. All you have to do is pop it into the microwave and you're good to go. So for the time starved amongst us, it's a great way to skip lunchtime takeout or at least put a nice meal on the table at dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash Goop to get $25 off your first order of six meals. That's $25 off plus free shipping at Freshly.com slash Goop. Okay, let's get back to our chat with Dr. Robin Berman. One thing that I think it's important to go back to that you were, I would say, prophetic about is several years ago now, right? Maybe three years ago, we did a, that triptych of content around narcissism. When you're parented by a narcissist, followed by when you're involved with a narcissist, and recovery yeah. from... And then followed by, how do you find an emotional grown-up? Exactly. What does that look like? What does someone who's not a narcissist look like? And obviously, it's since that it went gangbusters on our site at the time and now narcissism is one of it's epidemic and it's one of the main obviously conversations in the culture right now and it's so interesting to think about it from the perspective of having a narcissistic parent and how that skews your entire reality yeah or a narcissistic you know, anybody, you know, a teacher, a leader, whatever it's, it skews your, your whole environment to, because you have a lens where you, so in a normal dyad, whether it's the father, whether it's the mother, they're mirror neurons, literally they're called mirror neurons in your brain. And so you're, you look at your baby with love and then those mirror neurons reflect back and it's this beautiful reflection of light. Right. But if you are, raised by a narcissist, the mirror is reversed. So you're feeding them, you're fueling them, you're taking care of them, you're shoring them up because underneath every narcissist lies a super vulnerable person who doesn't feel good about themselves at all. So they need this external shoring, which is like a bottomless pit. It'll never be filled up. They get easily angered, easily rejected. Even honest feedback is seen as a personal critique. They fly into rage. They're thrilled when people are complimenting them. Imagine dating that kind of person or living your aunt. You just sign up to be on a roller coaster. You are just buckling up for life to be on a roller coaster. And I think the self-esteem movement fueled narcissism accidentally. So the self-esteem movement was all about, we grew up seen and not heard. And then this gen, this last decade said, oh, we were going to really pay attention to our kids. But paying attention is different than grandiosity. Mm -hmm. So the grandiosity is when I give a lecture, I show a slide that I Googled the top shirts at Target and Walmart that were selling. It was like this way to genius. You can't stop me. Eat my dust. Gorgeous princess. Like everything was this exaggerated, grandiose crock of shit, right? (laughs) And, and that, that isn't character development. What makes you feel good is about feeling good on the inside, feeling like a good human being, feeling like a kind person. People who are kind live longer. Mm-hmm. Is that crazy? When you volunteer, they did a study where you volunteer in organizations like to feed the elderly or feed the homeless. These people actually lived longer. It's like it raises your watching Mother Teresa raises the serotonin in your brain. People want to feel connected. And narcissism is the exact opposite Mm -hmm. of what it feels like to feel connected. So you spend your childhood either being engulfed by a narcissist and trying to please them. So whatever, it's like walking on a minefield. You you spend your life dancing on these eggshells. What's going to set them off and trying to be perfect, trying to give them what they need and then thinking, well, maybe if I take care of them, they'll eventually come along and be able to take care of me. Right. And unfortunately, that goes back to what you're saying about separating out. That ship has sailed. Very unlikely if that's a severe narcissist who doesn't 
get work done on themselves, right? Who doesn't get work done on themselves? Part of it is exactly what you said, A, grieve, and then B, starting to separate out, this isn't me. Mm -hmm. This isn't me. I had a patient who saw the world through a paranoid lens. Her mom was a paranoid schizophrenic. And so every, even when I went to give her like, a, you know, a sleeping pill when she was in medical school, she was like, oh my God, you're poisoning me. I was like, no, that is actually a belief that you inherited from a paranoid lens. Mm -hmm. And let me show you what a lens looks like that's full of faith and not full of fear. Mm -hmm. So the beginning is, of course, the beginning. But I think our whole journey as souls on this planet is to get to the other side of that. Mm -hmm. We come here to learn those lessons from our parents and continue to evolve and change and transform and hopefully eclipse them in mm -hmm. terms of what they know and how they parented and how they loved. I mean, ideally, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's it's also... a I, Growing up feels like a journey of trying to understand the truth, sort of about who you are and what you're about and and stripping off the things that are projected on you or that T-shirt of this way to genius um, mm -hmm. or gorgeous princess or whatever it was. And it's I think narcissism is interesting, too, because there is such a disconnection from the truth, but also you can understand how that would manifest in a parent-child relationship where you're just you learn something that's not, it, it is a lens, right? It is. A, and I think if you don't have the fuel inside and having that point of your child, where we say this way to genius, oh, wait a minute, that's a little grandiose. Mm -hmm. You know, I might be good at math, but my English could use some, you know, having, and that's why when parenting, oh my gosh, your, your drawing looks like Picasso. I'm like, eek. <laughs> you know, I like the way you used orange and yellow in your picture. It's really cool <laughs> because you, they don't believe it. Exactly. It doesn't feel right mm -hmm. you know it doesn't feel right so when somebody accurately sees you we always say or I always say and I've told you this the highest form of romance period mm -hmm. to be seen mm -hmm. to be known to be loved for that person and so when you are doing a scribble and your mom tells you or your dad tells you it's Picasso it's like really that doesn't look like Picasso to me. Then you start feeling like there's a true self, false self. Exactly. And you start living in this, this way to awesome. I'm a genius. And you start shoring up this grandiose bravado and falsehood, which you get further and further and further away from your authentic truth. Mm -hmm. The point is everybody's story. If you go back to the heart, you can get to the empathy of what happened to somebody that they had to shore themselves up. Any narcissist is shoring themselves up from the outside in. Anybody who uses alcohol to soothe themselves thinks that they're going to get soothing from alcohol or a food act is going to get it from food or a shopaholic or a sex act. And that's an unfillable place from the, from the outside in. So, yes, yeah, separating from that distorted lens is so freeing. Like my patient with the paranoid schizophrenic, it's, it's when she became a doctor, you know, when she was prescribing medication and see, it was so freeing that her, that it was like the lens lifted and she had her own sight again. Mm -hmm. Cause I truly believe every soul comes in kind of perfect. Mm -hmm. I perfect. agree. And it's just a shitty projection set. Mm -hmm. I mean, you project that you project your fear, you project your anxiety, you project, you want them to be perfect. Oh, I like soccer. I want you to like soccer. Oh, you know, I love books. You should love books. And that's where it versus I see you, mm -hmm. right? That's really, and I think that's why dogs are so lovable. They're just a wad of unconditional love. They stay that way. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have language, you know, so they stay in that kind of unconditional vortex of love mm -hmm. and then are able to give that love. I always end my parenting lectures with a, a slide. I wish I could show you the slide, but it's a picture that was drawn and my son drew the picture and he had, um, he was like really big in the picture and I was really small and he was like giant. I was like, wow, you are so big and grandiose, central. Wow. And he said, well, I've grown so big because you look at me with hearts in your eyes. Aww. I've grown so big. And he was five. And he's, and I was thinking, when you look at someone with hearts in their eyes, they grow. And so when patients come in, I'm terrible at this. I think I should, I'm this. I should have stopped drinking. I should have done this. I da, da, da. Enough. Doesn't that, that plan has been a bust. That self-critique gets us nowhere. 
don't we deserve to dish some love to ourselves if we didn't have the hearts and the eyes from our mothers? Get it from our girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Get it from our partners. So can you imagine a world if we lived in a place where everybody looked at everyone as their highest good Mm -hmm. without judgment, without trash talking, without digging deep into their own stance and their own opinion and being in judgment and oh this person isn't that enough or that there's so the love goggles need to come back focusing on character and kindness all of those internal structures are a formula for happiness for moving on to your from your own imperfect childhood for being impeccable with your word, like the guy who says from the four agreements, my girlfriend I, who I was out with, Susie, I said, oh my gosh, tell me that story. And she said, oh, I'm holding someone's confidence. I said I couldn't. Mm-hmm. I felt so safe. Mm-hmm. You, Because I'm a psychiatrist. I hold confidence, right? <laughs> like we hold confidence all day long. But when you have a friend you know who said, I was asked not to say, so I'm not going to say, that's self-esteem. Mm-hmm. That's a sense of wholeness, a wholeness of being, right? Where you know. So it's character building, being impeccable with your word, grieving your childhood, letting go of whatever lens it was, Mm -hmm. whether it's a paranoid lens, whether it's a narcissistic lens. Some narcissists are so enmeshed. It's like a web. You have to kind of get rid of the cobwebs Mm -hmm. of that spider. It's very engulfing and it's very crazy making. That is such a profound idea. Just like that moment of maybe like flipping the page in the journal, fresh start, clipping attachments. I think it can feel ponderous and impossible and so much work to try to start to untangle some. And for some people, I know it is, I know it's a long process, but I feel like for so many others, it's just like awareness and permission, right? Permission to love yourself. Yeah. Permission to feel lovable. Permission to do it a different way. Permission to delete those negative voices in your head. Sometimes the smallest things that lead to the most profound change. Thanks so much for joining our interview with Dr. Berman today. You can learn more about her work at permissiontoparent.net and at goop.com slash the podcast. Now, before I get to my own ongoing reparenting work, I'm going to take a question from one of you. How do you stay motivated to work out? Asks Susie. She also asks if I've ever tried TRX training, which I have not. Should I? It sounds interesting. You know, I have to tell you that a trainer that I've worked with for a long time, Tracy Anderson, gave me a golden piece of advice about working out, I don't know, probably 10 or 11 years ago now, where I was saying I can't get motivated to work out. I don't want to do it. I just don't feel like doing it today. And she said to me, do you ask yourself that question before you brush your teeth in the morning? No, you just brush your teeth. She said, just work out. Stop giving yourself the option. And for some reason, it really flipped a switch for me. And now I think of it as just something I do, like brushing my teeth. Have a question? Drop us a line at Goop on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share with your friends. To keep up with new episodes, just hit subscribe. And for more info, head over to goop.com slash the podcast. See you next week.